Greetings again, everybody. We're going to talk here about bronchiectasis. Bronchiectasis is a uh, disorder of the large bronchi, and it's secondary to either a congenital or acquired disorder, which involves dilation and compensation of the walls of the large bronchi. So it's due to chronic inflammation, but why we get that chronic inflammation is really uh, up in the air. There are multiple different causes of what can what can cause that inflammation. But what it has in common, regardless of the causes, bronchiectasis is dilation and compensation of the large bronchi uh, due to chronic inflammation. It can be either congenital or acquired, but in general, in the United States, it is congenital. So chronic inflammation destroys the elastin and cartilage and that causes dilation and weakening of the bronchial walls. In the U.S., the number one cause is cystic fibrosis, which results in impaired ciliary mobility, and hence you're not able to clear a material from the lungs, and that results in chronic infection. There are some other causes, uh, other things that cause impairment of the ciliary clearance system, for instance, Cartagener syndrome, uh, which is primary ciliary dysmotility. Uh, other things could be uh, situs inversus, chronic lung infections, impaired immunity. So both of those things are a primary lung infection. So it doesn't have anything to do with the, the cilia, but you're still getting constant lung infections, and that can cause uh, disruption of the bronchial wall over time. And then acquired anatomical abnormalities, and that's something you're born with. The symptoms of bronchiectasis are going to be primarily cough and sputum. So chronic productive cough and mucopurulent sputum. The, the, the sputum is always mucopurulent. Sometimes it's blood tinged, but it's always going to be pussy and mucusy. Uh, the, the cough is generally every day. And so these are symptoms that we tend to associate with cystic fibrosis. And indeed, the number one cause is cystic fibrosis. So patients who have cystic fibrosis almost always have bronchiectasis as well. And that's the major, uh, major finding in their condition. Other things that you may see uh, are dyspnea and uh, hemoptysis. Generally, it's very minor hemoptysis. It's not, uh, it's not gross hemoptysis. And then you can sometimes see systemic manifestations uh, like fever, uh, low-grade fever, weight loss, and anemia. You can have acute exacerbations of bronchiectasis, and that's just where you get increased sputum over baseline, uh, thicker sputum over baseline, uh, uh, higher fever, increased shortness of breath, pleuritic pain. Uh, and usually patients with cystic fibrosis or uh, with bron bronchiectasis have about two to three episodes of exacerbations per year. So as mentioned, the symptoms of bronchiectasis are the cough and the sputum, chronic cough, chronic sputum. And most of the patients have cystic fibrosis or have had a repeated history of pulmonary infect infections. Physical exam doesn't really tell us that much about the, uh, about the condition. It's pretty nonspecific, although you may hear wheezing at the bases of the lungs. As far as diagnosis, the best initial and most accurate diagnostic test is going to be a chest CT. Now, you may not be thinking bronchiectasis right away. You might be thinking pneumonia. If a patient comes in with a fever and cough and sputum, you may be thinking pneumonia and you may get a chest x-ray. With a chest x-ray, a lot of times with bronchiectasis, it's going to be equivocal. So you're not going to see anything that makes you think pneumonia. And that's a tip-off to bronchiectasis, particularly if the patient has a low-grade fever and they've got this cough, mucopurulent sputum, you know something's going on. And so uh, that can point you towards bronchiectasis. What you can sometimes see on chest x-ray is tra uh, this tram tracking, which is uh, where you've got visible thickening of the bronchial wall. Uh, and so you see what looks like kind of train tracks along the, uh, the, bronchial, uh, the bronchial pathway. But a lot of times, either the radiologist doesn't note that, you don't note that, or it's not there. As I said, the, most, uh, the best 
and most accurate test. If you're suspecting bronchiectasis, the best initial test is going to be to get a high resolution chest CT. And that's going to be, uh, that's going to give you a definitive uh, diagnosis. Once you've made the diagnosis, if it's the initial diagnosis of bronchiectasis, it's important to get baseline pulmonary function tests at some point. Uh, not when they're having their acute exacerbation, but once they've been diagnosed with bronchiectasis and they've gotten out of their acute exacerbation, to get pulmonary function tests on them so you can, uh, you can establish what their baseline is. So here's an example of a chest x-ray with bronchiectasis that does show that so-called tram tracking. And you see it right here. So you see thickening of the bronchial walls. Usually you don't see a whole lot of the bronchial walls uh, in a normal chest x-ray, but in this case you do. And this would be like the best way you can see the tram tracking where you see you've got the outer lining of the bronchial wall here and then you've got another lining here and so th these uh, the, the space in between these two linings are really the inflammatory space uh, between the outer wall and the uh, the lumen if you will of the bronchial uh, of the, the large bronchi all right so here's a normal chest CT just for reference so you can see here you can see some of the larger uh, bronchi here, these larger holes. And then why you see mostly black here is because you've got uh, open space. You've got alveoli all over. So here's bronchiectasis and you see some large, uh, th these large uh, uh, bronchi, but really what these are are smaller bronchi that have been uh, enlarged due to the inflammation, due to the damage of the, uh, of the cartilage and the elastin. And you see also inflammation in between the, the, the bronchi. On this side, it looks actually quite normal. And um, you can get different patterns of bronchiectasis. You can get focal bronchiectasis. That's usually due to a recurrent pneumonia, TB, uh, or a recurrent fungal infection. Or you can get diffuse bronchiectasis where it's generally the same appearing all over and that's usually due to uh, your congenital conditions like cystic fibrosis or Cartagener syndrome. So what do we do for patients with bronchiectasis once they've been diagnosed? We treat them with prophylactic antibiotics and that's because one of the biggest problems, what causes their dilation of the bronchi is that they get infections. And so if we can reduce the bacterial load in their lungs, then we're going to reduce the amount of infection and we'll reduce the inflammation. So we put them on prophylactic antibiotics. Generally, we shift their antibiotics every few months or so. Um, obviously, this is going to be managed by an infectious disease specialist or a pulmon pulmonologist who's got more specialized knowledge, but you can use anything like amoxicillin, azithromycin, uh, Bactrim, uh, a fluoroquinolone, or a second generation cephalosporin, obviously oral, uh, and that will help reduce the bacteria load and reduce the progression of bronchiectasis. You want to keep an aggressive pulmonary toilet. That's going to keep uh, that's going to keep your uh, your your lungs inflated, and it's going to uh, it's going to also help clear out some of the uh, some of the mucus. Uh, remember, keeping that mucus there is keeping the bacteria there, and the bacteria is going to reproduce the longer it stays there. So you really want to get out as much air as you can. Uh, and we do this generally with an incentive spirometer that these patients can take home so they can make sure that they're breathing in deeply and breathing out deeply. And any patient with bronchiectasis, any patient really, but any patient with bronchiectasis even more so should be advised to stop smoking because that's just going to uh, reduce the uh, ciliary clearing mechanisms even more so. Patients with bronchiectasis, uh, as in with most pulmonary diseases should receive the pneumococcal vaccine and they should also get the annual flu vaccine. In the event of an exacerbation, which as I mentioned is increased sputum over baseline, uh, thicker sputum, low grade to high fever, increased shortness of breath, 
pleuritic pain, generally these patients are going to need to be admitted. And that's just in general to the fact that most of these patients that have bronchiectasis have cystic fibrosis. And in patients who have cystic fibrosis, we are concerned about, uh, about uh, the, the presence of, uh, of severe disease, particularly uh, pseudomonas. So pseudomonas infection can be lethal, and so we want to make sure that uh, we're addressing that if it's present. So what we're going to do for these patients, we're going to admit them, we're going to give them supplemental oxygen, that's going to be titrated to 90%. Uh, if you can't uh, titrate them to 90% with nasal cannula or with a mask, you can do CPAP or BiPAP. Routine labs and sputum culture should be done before you administer antibiotics, so you should get a CBC at least, a CMP, and then uh, your sputum cultures. Generally, these patients don't have any difficulty expressing sputum. And particularly, you want to make sure that you tell the lab that you're looking for pseudomonas and mycoplasma. You want to also administer broad-spectrum antibiotics. If they have cystic fibrosis, which most patients with bronchiectasis, as I mentioned, do have cystic fibrosis, you're just going to assume that they have pseudomonas. And that's because we don't want to wait for the cultures to come back and have the patient deteriorate for three days while we're not treating their pseudomonas. So that's why we get the cultures first and then we treat them as if they have pseudomonas. So we're going to use broad spectrum antibiotics, but you need to make sure that the antibiotic that you're giving them, at least one of them, includes something that's effective against pseudomonas. And I'll give you a list of some of the drugs that are effective against pseudomonas. You're going to be giving them beta agonist bronchodilators. That's partially to help with their symptoms, but it's also to help them uh, help them get air down into the lowest part of their lungs. Chest physiotherapy. There's this uh, machine that they use. I'm not exactly sure what it's called. I've seen it, but I've never had to order it for a patient. And it's basically it just kind of presses on the on the chest and kind of bumps on it. Uh, and that's to help clear the, the mucus out. And then uh, aggressive pulmonary toilet, incentive spirometer as usual. In bronchiectasis, unlike in COPD, expectorants are okay. Because in bronchiectasis, it's really the sputum that's the problem. And so expectorants are okay to help them clear out the mucus. So some antibiotics, these are antibiotics on the top here that you would use more on an outpatient basis. Amoxicillin, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, or Bactrim, azithromycin, a second generation cephalosporin, or fluoroquinolones. Obviously taken oral on an outpatient basis. You can administer these inpatient as well, um, but generally when the patient is inpatient, we wanna make sure that we are administering something that is effective against pseudomonas. So some of the good ones to use are Piperacillin tazobactam, uh, which is marketed as Zosin, Ty uh, Tycercillin clavulonate, Tobramycin, Mirapenem, and Imipenem. I bold-faced these three here because these are the ones that I would go to first. And the reason is because they have fewer adverse effects and because Tobramycin can be given in an inhaled form and that has shown to be more effective in bronchiectasis and cystic fibrosis than IV formulations. Of course, you're going to be giving IV formulations if you can't give an inhaled version, but uh, an inhaled version would be most pr preferable. And so tobramycin is a great drug for that. The complications from bronchiectasis include massive hemoptysis. Uh, if you rupture a larger vessel, then you can get more hemoptysis, but usually it's just small vessels that are ruptured rather than large vessels. Uh, core pulmonary and abscesses.